I'll be reading this morning, but first of all, if you know I'm reading scripture, I'm going to ask you to stand as we honor God in reading the scripture, so you stand with me, please. I'll be reading from Revelation chapter 22, Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5, and I'll be reading the ESV version. Again, Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his servants will worship him. They will see his face. And his name will be on their foreheads, and the night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light. And they will reign forever and ever. You may be seated. Good morning. Last week we talked about the parable of the soils, or the parable of the sower. And I mentioned... As an illustration, the fact that I have a brown thumb. I'm not great with plants. Can't keep them alive. I water them too much or too little. And so we had small groups at our home that following evening, that same evening, and someone brought me a plant. (laughs) I haven't touched it, haven't looked at it, haven't breathed on it, and it's still alive thus far. So I thought it would be fitting for us to talk about some gardens this morning. I distinctly remember I was 11 or 12 years old, and my mother took me to Williamsburg, Virginia, real close to where we both grew up, my wife and I, and we saw the Williamsburg Botanical Gardens, and it was all in bloom, and it was beautiful. It was the first time I remember distinctly looking at something that God created before I knew there was a God, and thinking, that thing is beautiful. I've never seen so many flowers. I've never smelt that much pollen. I've never sneezed so hard. I remember coming home, and my dad was there. He was in from the road, and I told him, you know what I think I want? He goes, what? I "I think I want a garden. And so I imagined that we would go in the backyard and get the tiller out, and we have this property, and we put some roses back there and some other kind of beautiful flowers. And when I said I want a garden, I thought of Williamsburg Botanical Gardens. And my dad thought, vegetable garden. (laughs) And it wasn't until we were done, and we were planting all the uh, spare, uh, we had uh, broccoli, we had Brussels sprouts, we had tomatoes, we had some corn. And then I asked my dad, where are the flowers? And he goes, what? I go, nothing, never mind. This is what I wanted. I'll take care of these vegetables really, really well. I I go, okay. So we had just a miscommunication about what I expected versus what I got. And what I got was a lot of weeds in a garden. He told me to weed every day, and I never did. (laughs) Gardens are a special thing, not just in our own lives, to see God's beauty, to see his creation, to see these intricate beautiful things that just grow for a little while and then when I walk near them they die immediately but they're just temporary they're just here for a moment we get to appreciate that in the springtime but did you know that in the very beginning of creation one of the first things that God created was a garden if we go to the book of Genesis chapter 2 now I did these slides. Hey, it's full screen. How about that? (laughs) Little miracles happen every now and again. Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. This is immediately following verse 7, believe it or not. And in verse 7, you have mankind being formed from the dirt or the dust of the ground. Uh, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, is verse 7. And then verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east... And there he put the man whom he had formed. So immediately you have the creation of mankind made in God's image. And he was put in a very specific place or location. God wanted a place for his man to be. Verse 9. Out of the ground 
the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the middle of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The, first of, the name of the first was Pishon. It was the one that flowed all around the land of Havalia, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Dilam and Onyx Stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It's the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, keeping in mind here, Moses being the author, he's talking about the location of where those rivers were in relation to what land was there during the, the days of Moses to give us a, a quick little lesson of where those uh, locations were. Verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, because in the day that you eat of it, then you shall surely die. Now, we look at this text, and really for many of us, it's somewhat familiar. Hopefully it sounds somewhat familiar to you this morning. We're not going to go into a longer exposition of what each particular verse may mean, the point I'm trying to drive home here is that one of the most important things that God created beyond our physical universe and the way that it's so intricately designed and not even the animals that are around us and abundant and plentiful for, for various purposes, we have mankind being formed to be the image of deity, the image of God, and the very next thing that God formed was not something that was necessarily useful for the operation of our world, but was just beautiful. You had food that was there. You had flowers that were there. You had trees that were there. It was a place for man to be. And he was given a very specific job in verse 15. Adam, or the man, was given the role as being someone to work the garden and to keep it. That word keep there literally is rendered protect. And so the first job of mankind from creation was to keep and protect the garden that God had made. Now, the very first thing that we are told here in this scripture about the purpose of man is not necessarily in relation to the garden, but in the relation to how we are formed. I mentioned briefly before that we are formed in the image of God, and thus being formed in his image, man's first priority was to be an image bearer. Sometimes you may remember or recall to your mind that when folks would go out to war back in the day, you'd have a guy carrying a flag. And that guy carrying the flag would represent who that army belongs to. And the same thing is true when it comes to us as God's created beings. We are in a way bearing his flag, his signal of who God is, not only to ourselves, but to the world as well. We are image bearers for the creator. And we bear that image not only in the land in which we dwell now, but all the way back in the beginning, Adam was that image bearer in the garden. It's a very special place. Now, if we look at this particular passage, things don't turn out the way that we would hope it would turn out. Mankind chooses to rebel against God, thinking that he knows better than the Creator, choosing to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, realizing that they were not wearing clothing and had to be ashamed and hide their face from the, the God that created them. If we look at this particular text here, we see the intention of what God desired. He desired a beautiful, productive place for his created beings, mankind, to be and to bear his image. That was the original intention of the Garden of Eden, a place where he could live and dwell among them in this beautiful garden 
be their God, and he would be his people. Now, if we keep on reading throughout the narrative of Scripture, we move forward a couple of books, and we go to the book of Numbers, chapter 25. We could have gone really anywhere in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and and found something similar to this, unfortunately. But in Numbers chapter 25, there's a whole lot of backstory here. It's killing me not to go into, but for the sake of it, verse 25. Let's read this from the New King James Version because this is a bit more clear, in my opinion, about what we're talking about in the very first verse. Numbers 25, beginning in verse 1. Now Israel, talking about the people of Israel, of Jacob, that were made a great nation by God's might and power and blessing. Now Israel remained in the Acacia Grove. And the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. So kind of to set the stage for us a little bit clearer. You have the nation of Israel that was blessed by God to be fruitful, to multiply, and to be a blessing to all the nations eventually. They were in Egypt, and they were led away from Egypt, from bondage, from slavery, by God's power, and by his mercy, led by Moses through the wilderness. They eventually settled in the land that's called the promised land of Canaan. But Before that takes place, we find that they are influenced by the pagan worship, the idol worshipers that are around them. Here in this context, the Moabites. So they were intermingling with them, they were intermarrying with them, and they began to pick up their practices of worshiping uh, worshiping their idols as well. And because they were so involved with the people of Moab, they invited the people to make sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. And so Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. You have the first commandment given to the Israelites. It seemed to be a pretty important one. It's number one, after all. And they were breaking this particular commandment at this time. Now, the way that it would happen here in the ancient Near East is oftentimes you would have deserted or desert places described in the geography. But every now and again, you would have groves. And these groves were essentially an oasis. They were a green location in which it was blessed by God. And Baal, or Ashtara, as she's known a little bit later on, a different deity, was thought to be the deity of spring, of renewal, and fertility. And so what you would do by worshiping Ashtara in the groves is that you would commit fornication and be grateful and be thankful for the idea of renewal, of replenishing, of the springtime, and of procreation. Now, Israel was so influenced by this particular kind of worship towards this deity that we see the only garden talked about in Israel are the groves that belonged to the idols. What this is is a symbol for us that originally God made man in his image to be an image bearer for who God is and put him where? In a garden, a beautiful, fruitful place to enjoy, to enjoy the abundance that God gave them. Mankind took that same garden and worshipped a false deity by committing sin against their creator And by using his expression of beauty, a garden, to commit sin. If you're looking for an image of what the human condition is, from God's perspective, to me that's pretty clear. Taking that which is beautiful and created by God and corrupting it, defiling it, and making it sinful in his sight. Unfortunately, that's true in a way for all of us. We are all in the same boat of taking that which is beautiful that God made for us to enjoy and to bear his image and unfortunately corrupting it, defiling it, and making it less than what God desired. But there's good news. God knows that's who we are. And he knows that we are but dust, that we are weak, fallible, sinful people. And he loves us anyway. He loves us anyway. 
the next garden that I want to talk about is one that's very personal and hopefully very touching when you read it along with me in Matthew chapter 26. I believe I have an image. At least I did yesterday. That is an actual image of the location described in the book of Matthew chapter 26. I'm sure it looks a a bit different (laughs) through 21st century landscaping techniques. But the trees that are present in this image are similar to the kind of trees that our Lord would have saw on the night in which he was betrayed. After he was with his closest friends, they shared the Passover meal in which he took the bread that was there, the unleavened bread, and used that as a symbol of his body that would be given for us. And he had the wine that was present, and he used that as a symbol of the blood that he knew he would have to shed. They sung a hymn, and then they went out to the Mount of Olives, this location in front of us. And there he was with his three closest friends, Peter, James, and John. And he retreated off by himself to pray to his father alone. Because he knew he was going to have to give his sinless, perfect life for our sins. In Matthew 26, beginning in verse 36, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. The language here is literally his stomach was churning. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Stay here and watch with me. It's like he doesn't want to be alone because he knows in just a couple of minutes he's going to be all alone. He went a little further. He fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What, couldn't you watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. We sung that just a moment ago, didn't we? Again a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. He came and found them sleeping again because their eyes were heavy. Now... I would never be guilty of allowing my eyes to be heavy. Only every time I lay on my couch. And I look over at Maddie, look over at Luke, look over at Melissa, she goes, taking a nap, I go, I'm going to just close my eyes and see what happens. I'm never surprised what happens. I fall asleep immediately, stay there for a couple hours, and then wake up. I understand the idea of wanting to be with Jesus. But you're tired. It's been a long day. And boy, did they not know how long that day would be. So he left them. He went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. He came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And here comes Judas. Happy to see him. There's something to be said about the fact that The original man, Adam, was formed and placed in a beautiful location, a garden. To keep and protect it was his mission. To be an image bearer of this garden, of who made it. We then see the corruption and defilement of that beautiful type of garden used to worship a God that did not exist. Mankind's nature right there to replace things of God with things of our own invention. It's a little bit ironic, wouldn't you think? The Son of Man, God in the flesh, God with us, Emmanuel, before he gives his life on the cross for all of mankind's sins, goes to a garden to pray to his Father. Might be a small connection there, wouldn't you think? In Revelation, 
we have John. He's an old man now, John the Elder, he calls himself. It's a very polite English way to say the old guy. <laughs> he gets a vision. It's a singular vision called the Revelation. The Apocalypse, literally, is how it's rendered in the Greek. And this great panoramic vision that he was shown in this great book was one singular vision. And at the end of the vision, can you guess what he saw at the very end? A garden. Where it all started, what God designed, what he intended, what he's always wanted was his people in a garden, bearing his image, made in his likeness, enjoying God's presence in the garden. We lost it. We corrupted it. We defiled it with things of this world, replacing God for things of sensuality. We see our Lord, our Savior, the great Lamb of God, as John called him in his, in the book of Revelation. He was in a garden praying for strength to allow God's will to be done. And then John the Revelator saw, at the very end of time, a garden awaiting us. Revelation 22, beginning in verse 1. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. I'm not sure what your experience is with natural springs. I don't know because I've never asked you, I guess. <laughs> I've only got one pretty good story about this, but it's hard to convey it because you weren't there with me. But there was a place where we used to live in Charlestown, West Virginia. And there's a place called Keys Gap on the Appalachian Trail. Karen, do you know about Keys Gap? Right next to Harper's Ferry, right at the midpoint of the Appalachian Trail. And Keys Gap, it's a great place. You park your car if you want, and you can go to Harper's Ferry, or you can go to Virginia. And Harper's Ferry is flat, Virginia is not. So I always go to Virginia. And so you hike up this little mountain, get to the very top, and go down, and there's a shelter that you can stay in. But there's something more special than the little shelter in the outhouse that was there. The more special thing was a natural spring. And so you hike down this mountain, you get to the very bottom, and there's a hole in the ground that's got a bunch of dirt and sticks and rocks, and even bugs all around it. But in this little hole, coming from the side of the mountain, there's water. And it's not brown, like you might expect. It is crystal clear. Now, you're supposed to filter this water or boil it to make sure it's safe, but I don't do that because I'm dumb. I got an empty water bottle. I dip it into the water. I pull it out, it's freezing cold. After a long two and a half hour hike, I chug this water and folks, it's the best water I've ever had. When John says, I saw a river coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb, it was clear as crystal. It was the water of life. That's what John saw. In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was, guess what? The tree of life. The same kind of tree described all the way back in Genesis. It's weird how the beginning of the book sounds like the end of the book. Almost like, here is what God wanted, and here is when God finally gets it in the end. Tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. The nations here is a, a kind of a poetic way to say all the people, no matter where they come from, all the nations. And there shall be no more curse, the curse from the garden when man fell. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him. They will see his face. Have you ever thought about the fact that we don't know what God looks like? 
what does God look like? I have no earthly idea. But when we're there, back in that city, back in that garden, his throne are there, and he's sitting on it. His servants are going to serve him. That's us. And we're going to see what God looks like. His name shall be on their foreheads, a very John way to say, all you think about all day long is him. There shall be no night there. There's no need for a lamp or a light of the sun because the Lord God gives them light. And they, us, shall reign forever and ever. God began his story, making man in his image, putting him in a garden to protect it. We took that same garden as mankind and corrupted it and made it defiled. It's just who we are. Jesus knew that and paid that penalty for us But before he did, he went to a garden to get strength from his heavenly Father. And we see ourselves in the future from John's revelation. We're before God once again. He's among us, his people. We get to see what he is. Get to look at him, think about him all day, serve him, and guess what? Reign with him forever and ever. We see a physical garden today, and we know seasons will change, flowers will fall off, and they'll die. Spring comes, they're reborn. For us, we see a garden, we don't see it being fleeting, we see it being eternal, because our Father is there. This morning, We have an opportunity. God has blessed us with this moment to look into his scripture, to see a theme in his word, to reap the benefits of what he's written, inspired, and preserved for us to know about him, his nature, and his desires for all of us. So the question is to to us, where do we stand in light of God's word? Are we living faithfully? Are we looking forward to that time that we're going to be in that city, in that garden, with God and the Lamb? The water of life is there. The tree of life is there. The creator of all known life is there, waiting for us to finally be where he intended, with him forever. If anyone has a need to respond to the invitation of our Lord, You can come forward and speak with us and we can pray for you and encourage you or you can see one of our elders at the door privately. Whatever your need may be this morning, please respond now as we stand and we sing.